So Women, Peace, and Security first started through UN Security Resolution 1325. So 1325 recognizes the disproportionate impact on conflict on women and girls. 11 years later, in 2011, Executive Order 13595 mandated WPS implementation and the US became the 50th country to have a national action plan. Following that, in 2017, the US WPS Act enabled comprehensive law um, for the DOD, Department of State, USAID, and the Department of Homeland Security and made them implementing agencies of WPS so that they could create their own lines of effort and implement the initiative accordingly. In 2019, the US strategy on WPS focused on whole of government approach and created implementation plans. And then in 2020, DOD implemented the WPS strategic framework and implementation plan, which is DOD specific um, and directly impacts us now. So this graphic shows uh, the WPS strategic framework. You can see on the left hand side, the global WPS principles. So this is uh, UN based and it is impacting all of our partner nations as well as the US. Uh, in the center uh, are national lines of effort. So these are lines of effort that are nationally implemented by all of the agencies that I listed in the prior slide. So state, USA, DOD, and Homeland Security. And then departmentally, the DOD has its own specific <coughs> principles of WPS implementation um, that is reported back to Congress. So DOD has three lines of effort for WPS. Uh, the first one is modeling and employing me women's meaningful participation in the joint force. The second is promoting partner nation women's participation in all occupations in the defense and security sectors. And the third is ensuring partner nations protect women and girls, especially during conflict and crisis. Um, there are many ways to do this. It overlaps greatly with global health engagement. Um, one set of global health engagements that directly uh, is impacted by women, peace, and security, and also uh, global health security is uh, AF Athletes, an initiative on gender-based violence. Um, and those global health engagements filter up into women, peace, and security. The DOD spent $5.5 million in fiscal year 2021 to uh, enact women, peace, and security. And this comes in many forms. So AFRICOM has a gender advisor, Ms. Lindsay Brothers, who's in charge of women, peace, and security for AFRICOM as a whole. Uh, she's a great resource, and women, peace, and security is her primary job. She's in charge of training gender focal points, um, like me. So she trains gender focal points throughout AFRICOM as well as throughout each individual component. So CTAF has gender focal points throughout the organization, but none of them are medical. So if you need anything medical that relates to WPS, I would be the best contact. And more broadly, Lindsay Brothers is an excellent resource for women, peace, and security as a whole. The four pillars of women, peace, and security and national action plans are prevention, participation, protection, and relief and recovery. And this is the basis of the US National Action Plan as well as our partner countries. So when you're working with a country for global health engagement, it might be helpful to check and see if they have a national action plan for women, peace, and security. When I worked with gender-based violence in Tunisia, they had a national action plan, but it was only in Arabic and hadn't been translated to English. So that was, a, that was challenging, but it was important to know that they have that strategic framework and they're working through it and also prioritize women, peace, and security. So this might be something to look at prior to a global health engagement activity to ensure that you're comprehensively looking at the country and their participation in women, peace, and security. So these two resources have a few key terms and definitions that are useful. I'll run through a few of them uh, just slide by slide. So the first is 
in Women, Peace, and Security, we often reference security without defining it as a principle. So I like this slide because it goes from broad to narrow. So most broadly, national security is the safety of a nation against threats such as terrorism or war. Intra intrastate security is conflicts involving groups of people and states. And then human security refers to the security of people in communities, which we recently saw impacted greatly by flooding and earthquakes. Natural disasters can impact human security greatly. And so the economic decline, job loss, and recession kicks off a vicious cycle that leads to destabilization on the right. Destabilization leads to a decline in peace and security and a loss of women's rights. And then it becomes a perpetuating vicious cycle that leads to further destabilization. For women, peace and security, it's important to have measures and sex disaggregated data is an important key term because it creates metrics that we can measure country to country or just nationally to measure program improvement. So these data and statistics should have numbers of women and men broken out as such. A gender analysis uh, refers to the variety of methods used to understand relationships between men and women, their access to resources, their activities, and their constraints. Gender norms are ideals about how men and women should act, which are internalized and learned in early life. A gender perspective exposes gender-based differences in status and power. So in the next section, I'll go over a little bit more of the overlap between women, peace and security, and global health security. Uh, and I really like this Melinda Gates quote to kick off this section, um, that history teaches that disease outbreaks play out with grim predictability and expose and exploit existing forces of marginalization seeking out fault lines of gender, race, caste, and class. Global health security is prevention, early detection, and response to disease outbreaks so that they can be acted upon before they become emergencies. Uh, it's also the collective security across states and nations and international lines and the response to health concerns that threaten health of people worldwide. As we saw from COVID, diseases know no borders, so global health security relates to the fact that outbreaks can easily become global. The HIV and AIDS crisis uh, really showed the impact on women specifically. So it showed the role of women as caretakers as well as the undue burden on women that are created by challenges with healthcare systems as a whole. So this slide has outbreaks from HIV up through COVID where women were impacted differently than men. And a couple of statistics on this for COVID specifically was that women constituted 70% of healthcare workers during COVID and only 25% of healthcare senior leaders were women. Another anecdotal statistic that I think is interesting is that countries with male leadership have a six times higher COVID-19 death rate than countries with female leadership. I try to take that with a grain of salt um, because the statistics don't necessarily show causation, only correlation. However, um, I find it to be interesting that countries that were female-led have different death rates. And as a, an epidemiologist, I like statistics a lot and metrics. Um, so I actually usually routinely do a slide on how to determine whether women, peace, and security data are a good data source. Um, Georgetown Institute for WPS Indices tend to be what I consider an academically backed and useful data source. So WPS has uh, an index that Georgetown measures that uses inclusion, justice, and security to measure uh, women, peace, and security as a whole. They also have the INFORM index, which shows a country's vulnerability to crisis. 
So INFORM uses hazard and ex exposure, vulnerability, and lack of coping capacity. Um, and then when you look at the WPS index next to the INFORM index, you can see how the WPS index, as it decreases, makes the risk of crisis go up. Not necessarily indicating causation, but again, correlational uh, statistics here. So a couple of additional impacts of outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics on women are increase in gender-based violence cases. Um, women and girls in COVID were isolated due to school closures and quarantine measures, and the restricted mobility created confinement with abusers in some circumstances, uh, which became challenging globally, not just in the US and not just in our partner countries, but across the globe worldwide. Women's healthcare is also underfunded at baseline. So in strain systems, women's healthcare can be the first ones cut. For example, during times of COVID, uh, HIV care was often trimmed. So lastly, um, my ask for you is that in exercise planning and medical planning, you incorporate gender perspectives into your concepts and your development of different scenarios. So take into consideration uh, populations at risk, uh, account for the DOD lines of effort in women, peace, and security, and then collecting sex disaggregated data is also important. I'm open to any ideas from you as well. Now, with you having the knowledge of women, peace, and security principles, uh, going back to the exercise, if you have any questions on how to better implement these gender perspectives or these lines of effort, I am happy to answer them. And you can always use me as a resource. <laughs>